Good afternoon, everyone. I am Garbo Hearn, Director of Hearn Fine Art, located in the heart of the Dunbar community in Little Rock, Arkansas. Thank you for, be, for your presence this afternoon as we welcome and discuss our current exhibition, Home Wherever the Soul Connects. It's a father-daughter exhibition of paintings, drawings, and prints by Crawford and Louise Mandubwa. So we are coming to you from all over the world. Crawford is in Gaborone, Botswana. Louise is in Arkansas with me. And we have people from all over on the Zoom. So thank you for taking the time to spend your afternoon to talk to Louise and Crawford and listen to their art journey. I've had the pleasure of knowing the Mandumbas for over five years. And this is a culmination of a discussion that started probably in 2016 when I met Louise and I was so impressed by her presence, her work ethic, and just all around person that I really wanted to meet her father and her family. And once meeting them, this just seemed like a great way to honor um, a family and the traditions that they have and the, the amazing art that they both create. So today we are going to honor them by listening to their conversation and talk about the people that they have, are sharing uh, with their work. So thank you Crawford and Louise for your presence and we will start with Crawford. I'm mute. Okay, uh, sorry for that glitch. Uh, I just want to say thank you very much, Ms. Gabo, for those opening remarks and those uh, uh, wonderful words. Greetings to everyone indeed. Um, live, coming live from Haburani in Southern Africa. And it's an honor to be on this platform to be able to, to share with you uh, my story, our story, our art. Um, and just uh, all that we, we are about. So my name is Crawford Mandumbwa. Okay, and like many African names, uh, it almost affords you GPS coordinates. You can almost locate me just by my name. So my name uh, locates me, situates me in uh, a thicket uh, between the borders of Zambia and Angola. That's where I I, I come from. Uh, we, we leave our villages along the mighty rivers and busy, which is the lifeblood of our people and many other communities that live along the rivers it meanders from Central Africa into uh, down to the eastern coast of Africa uh, in, in Mozambique. So that's where I'm coming from. Uh, it's important to mention where I'm coming from because I also trace my, uh, my artistry, uh, my artistic endowment. Uh, you know, I look back and I see how somehow this uh, came down to me from my grandfather. My grandfather was a, a master craftsman uh, in the village. And he was like a Da Vinci of sorts, because he was so multi-talented. And in a few instances that I would visit the village, uh, you would see him uh, crafting all sorts of uh, artifacts. Uh, he would be uh, crafting uh, a knife, uh, you know, from a crude piece of uh, iron. You, you, know, you start with it in the morning and you watch him in the day, shape it into a beautiful uh, piece, uh, utility knife that, uh, you know, he would uh, sell, but most of the time these would be commissions. He would uh, craft weave baskets. Um, he was also uh, a builder. He would uh, build people's hearts and uh, thatch, thatch, thatch their roofs. And so he did all sorts of things. And, uh, a few times he would even take me along 
uh, to go into the bush to go dig up the roots that he would use to uh, for weaving the baskets or uh, get certain leaves and go boil them to be able to extract certain dyes for uh, for his for his work. So I trace my artistry uh, back. I owe it owe it to him. But uh, my personal practice, I trace it back to. I think I as as early as grade four, grade five, I could see that you know I was doing something that uh, you know people were amazed at. By grade five, I was being preferred by my teachers to do the the maps on the board, the diagrams on the board. So, and later I got I got to study uh, art formally. I uh, did an associates uh, in graphic design, and then an, an associates in art education, and then later I did uh, uh, visual multimedia um, as uh, my bachelor's. I must say. You won't believe it. My dream in high school, actually, was I wanted to be an architect, uh, but uh, God had a, had a different script for me. And um, by the time I completed high school, I knew I was going to be an artist. And even with different uh, challenges along the way, when I've tried to get off this train, God has brought me back onto art. Uh, so this is who I am. It's what I was meant to be. So I'm an art educator and. Uh, my fine art practice seems to uh, somewhat be shaped. Uh, it's, it's seasonal and it's dictated by the academic uh, life uh, of my, my, my employment. Uh, so uh, most of the time I do produce a lot of work I, uh, towards my, my vacations. That's when I do most of the production of, of my artwork and then could then get to exhibit right after the, the vacation I've produced body of work. I've been practicing for well over uh, 25 years and uh, my work has gone through so many transformations and you, you, if you see some of the work I've got right now, you won't believe it that my first artwork that I ever saw was actually a drawing uh, of a lion. Uh, since then, I, you know, I painted flowers, I painted uh, for landscapes with beautiful cerulean blue, you know, blue skies. I've also painted the beautiful warm embers of the African sunsets. I've done all those and later drifted on. I got to uh, work on my, uh, started working on human figures and then worked on, uh, focused on the faces and also working a lot with, with fabrics. I'll say in Creating my art, I think, uh, you know, for me, mimicry uh, has not been an issue. I, I can produce work, I can recreate. The big, one of the challenges I've had in my practice has been finding my voice. Uh, how to identify myself as an artist. Uh, for a long time, you know, I, I just worked, but, uh, uh, along the way, I started to question myself. And, if, you know, my, my initial works, I used to sign them Crawford, Crawford. Uh, but later, I, I got to realize how my identity was very important. And I got to realize some people, when they saw my name, they'll think, oh, I, is this guy British? Uh, so later I changed. And so I've also sought uh, to produce work that is, that is true to me, that embodies who I am, my convictions, my values. And so uh, I feel the more recent works are you know, speaking more uh, of who I really am and what, what I, am, I am about. Um, I started off working on paper, and um, if you, uh, Louise, can, uh, if we, can, we can share the image. My first piece was a piece where were, were watercolors on paper and I've uh, changed from the watercolors. I've moved on to canvas. And after working on canvas for quite a bit, I questioned myself still. I felt the canvas was very much Western, Eurocentric, and I sought to express myself in a way that also brought out 
the aspect of where I was coming from. And the surface that I've started using also uh, is the burlap. Uh, the burlap is a very coarse uh, material. Uh, it's, it's not your conventional art substrate. But I, I find that it helps me, helps to speak for me at many levels. I pick the burlap because it's a, a material from our, our communities that uh, it's, it's used for storage of, uh, of grain uh, from which people would uh, get the grain and whether using uh, just uh, mortars within the, the, the home, they would pound that or take it to uh, some grinder to go and have it ground at, at, a, at a fee the finer powder. So that's where the, 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 the burlap uh, is coming from. And I've also felt, fallen in love with fabrics. Um, I don't have many fabrics in this exhibition, but I, I use a lot of fabrics in my, in my work uh, because, you know, I found that the, the fabrics, that, these bright African fabrics are sort of characteristics, characteristics of, of our people. So I use uh, the African fabrics as well. Uh, in my in my work here and there, so you see uh, the piece that that's, that's being shared. It's very, uh, it's it's a piece. I, I must tell you the story. So, uh, plating uh, in Africa is a life skill. The girl, the girls do this so regularly. You know, everyone, everyone plates, uh, basically, and uh, that's. Uh, my wife was being plated and by, by, by a sister. And when you, there's, a, there's, a, there's an African saying that speaks volumes to, to, to this piece. And the saying in my mother, say, mother language is, Meaning, what is the mirror for uh, if your sister is plating? Basically, you don't need a mirror if it's your sister who's plating you, uh, you plating your hair. It talks about trust. You know, I think about our oh, cosmopolitan space. As you go to a saloon, you want uh, 360, 360 degree mirrors to see yourself all around. Uh, but uh, uh, in that uh, in that saying, it talks about the values, the family values that. Uh, you know, uh, people a, a, a spouse in the in, in their homes. So that's that's a one of the pieces I've got. Um, I've also I've got the one great uncle. Um, it's a piece that's uh, inspired by my my visit to my home village. I you know it's far away. Uh, it's 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 far because it's difficult to get there. But the total distance from where I am to my to my to my village, I want to translate this to, to miles, but I think it's it's under it's just just about just about a, under a thousand miles. I think just about under a thousand miles. Uh, but it's uh, something. Uh, it's not easy to get there. So I was there, had a trip uh, there with my wife, and uh, I got to visit my great uh, grand uncle. And I took photographs with him, and but as I got to interact with uh, with you know other family members, they got to speak about him in different ways. And what I saw, what he uh, you know brought out, what what he exudes, uh, it was quite interesting to hear how people saw him. He had these different personas uh, all about him. Some of them are maybe uh, you know not being perceived in the positive and so on. But uh, every family, not just my, not just my, just my grand uncle, but even just my other uncles, uh, and I see my own, my, my father's side, every family has someone who, you know, I think fits this, um, this, this character. And so uh, that's what this piece, uh, uh, you know, uh, is about, it's inspired by, by that, that one great uncle. Uh, I wish I could speak more, but I think I need to uh, create room and allow uh, Louise to also speak 
But before I, I do that, I must say the theme uh, of this exhibition uh, really touches me, touches us uh, in, a, in a big way. Um, I'm, 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 just, I'm just debating whether to go on. I think let me leave it to Louise. We'll pick it up when we do the conversation of, conversation of peace. Uh, but let me leave it to Louise to also pick up the discussion on, on her, her journey as an artist. All right, thank you. Um, I hope everybody can hear me okay. Uh, I would like to just echo the sentiments of my dad and of Garbo to say thank you all for taking the time to sit down with us and participate in this conversation and get to hear about our practices, respectively. My name is Louise Mandumbwa and I'm a visual artist working here in Central Arkansas. I would like to think of myself as something of an honorary Arkansan because my entire tertiary or higher education experience has been in central Arkansas and I've really gotten to engage with this community, but maybe beyond that, make connections that I've felt have been really meaningful with some of the people here. Uh, one of the things that we will probably touch on later is just you know, ideas of home and how that changes when you are a person that is migrating through a space. Uh, so in terms of my citizenship, I am a Zambian that was born and raised in Botswana and is now living in the U.S. And so my ideas of home have always kind of revolved around the people that I have built relationships with. Uh, unlike my dad, who has maybe had a more illustrious evolution of his work through his practice, mine has always been very centered on people, uh, specifically immigrants that I've gotten to interact with. And so some of my older works that I'm getting to share with you kind of still show this interest that I have in the face, maybe because of how much emotion that carries and how you're able to really engage and connect with someone when you truly look at them. I think what I find that I truly value isn't just the exchange that art can facilitate, but uh, that people are willing to look a little closer when it is a piece of artwork that they're looking at. So while they might you know, pass by an individual in the street, when you place a portrait in front of someone, they really stop and engage with that work in a way that's a little bit different, in a way that's wanting to understand and ask questions about this person and their story. And so I'd like to think of myself as a storyteller uh, every iteration of what I'd hoped I would be when I was younger was some version of a storyteller. So, uh, you know, to write children's books or to be a journalist or an illustrator, I've always been interested in stories. And I'm really privileged that I get to share stories that are so personal in this exhibition, because one thing that's truly special is that every individual that we've made work of or about is someone that we know personally. Uh, so to speak to one example from some of my older pieces, uh, this lovely individual is Dr. Masiku Gauzi. Uh, she's based in North Carolina currently, but she's someone who I grew up knowing in Francistown, Botswana. And I think it speaks to you know, not just people moving in the world because now we're in a similar space to one another, even though we're halfway across the world, but really this being someone that I looked up to so much. Uh, I think there's such power in the gaze. And so I really try to engage that in my work. I always try to frame people as looking forward to something, looking up at something or back at something. But in the few occasions that I use the direct gaze, I think it can be really powerful. And it says something about seeing and what it means to be seen and who gets to be seen. Uh, so the different materials that I'll kind of speak about in my section of this talk are where I think I'm able to tell those stories best, which is in drawings and prints and paintings. Uh, one of the drawings that I did first when I developed this exhibition was of someone that I got to photograph when I got to visit Francis Town in 2018. This individual is Jacob, and he's actually a security guard, a long-standing security guard at the high school that I attended in Francis Town. And uh, Dad might be able to speak to this as well, but he's just a really wonderful and colorful personality. Um, and I, I think art, in addition to being a space that can foster conversation, can truly foster so much more understanding and empathy in how we interact with people. And so I, I always try to frame everyday people as a center part of how I make work and think about work. And so the security guard of the school might not be someone that you would look twice at, but the person that he is is what makes him worth being a subject of something like a piece of art. Uh, the next individual is someone that I similarly have a relationship with, someone that I grew up knowing, and I think is a wonderful person that I learned so much from. Her name is Kili Dile. 
Um, and I was happy to be able to title most of my pieces after the people that I got to make work of. But this particular piece, uh, I, I think it is important to be able to understand how to say people's names correctly. Uh, there's an energy in being able to say someone's name correctly and taking the effort to be able to call someone by their name. Uh, and I think maybe as an immigrant, I have an additional appreciation of that because sometimes when you are halfway across the world, your name is all you have. And it speaks not only to you, but all the people that you are representing, all the people that have come before you. So um, that's something that you might notice in multiple pieces if you look at the show online. It is often someone's name. And I try to be very intentional about that. And then the last piece that I'll kind of touch on in my section is just a print to kind of speak to something else that dad spoke to as well, which is the use of African print in its illustrious history. Um, you know, I think African print is not only being used by the two of us, but, you know, several contemporary artists working in the diaspora get to use African print as a touch point to being in the diaspora, yes, but also African identity. Um, and thinking about really where that print comes from and its history, I really wanted to be able to engage in that by making my own print. So the south of the continent isn't where African print originated, as it were. Uh, it originally was the two fabrics that were produced in Indonesia that Dutch traders took to West Africa and found a market for. And then they adjusted the motifs and the colors and the textures they were using to engage with that market. But by the time you get to the south of the continent, a lot of the rich meaning in each of the fabrics is lost a little bit and it becomes a little more aesthetic about just enjoying the fabric. And so while my dad is very colorful in his presentation, and if you see his work, you'll understand why. Um, I wanted to be able to engage in the print by making something that I felt spoke to my own family history and myself, uh, you know, the way that I've come to understand how I exist in my own worldview. And so the flower in the image is a protea, which is a desert flower that you find in the south of the continent, uh, but also thinking about things of interconnection and how you know Ubuntu is something that I think a lot of people are getting to understand or hear about, and it's the idea that our humanity is inextricably connected from those around us. Or the quality that makes us most human is not intellect or the things that we invent, but our ability to really connect with and empathize with the people around us, that that quality is what makes us human. And so that idea of, you know, of being part of a tapestry of a wider community is what the weaving in this represents. So um, I think that might be the last slide in my section. And we can maybe get to speak about the exhibition as a whole and the themes that we were able to discuss. Could I, could I pick up Louise? Yes, please do. Uh, so then uh, from, from where I left off uh, leading on then, the issue of home is something that our family grapples with because uh, much like Louise has, has narrated, um, you know, she, she She's Zambian, yet she was born in Botswana, and uh, today she's in the US. And that also happens with myself and with our parents and grandparents. My grandfather came from Angola, and he settled in Zambia. My parents were born in, in Zambia. I was born in Zambia. Uh, my wife's parents were born in Angola. And my mother-in-law went and grew up in Congo DRC and only came to Zambia and got married in Zambia. And so the trip I spoke about going to the village was, is, is a very important trip. Uh, it, it dealt with an issue of our identity, of my wife's identity. Uh, in Africa, when you married, uh, basically, the wife's, uh, the husband's uh, village becomes the wife's village. My wife was born and bred in the city, and she felt she never felt complete because, as an African, you're supposed to have a home village, and she never had one. And so she longed for the day that we could go to the village 
Um, after after about 19 years or so, we managed to take a trip uh, to go to the village. And she was so excited you know, to say, now I belong uh, to your village. And so it helped to have a sense of belonging. So this issue of home is something we, we, we grappling with, dealing with. And so even Celestine and I married in Zambia, we had a week's honeymoon in Zambia and we relocated to Botswana. All our married life has been in Botswana. And so who are we? Today, I've spent half of my life in Botswana, half of my life in Zambia. Who am I? And I even have reverse culture shock today. When I drive back to Zambia, I feel a little bit lost, uh, you know, and when we come back, if we just cross the border, I feel like even if we are 500 kilometers away from home, you know, five hours, six hours drive to go, I feel like we have, we've arrived, we are home. Uh, so that's where we're coming from. That's our issue of, of identity um, that we, we, we grappling with as a family. And so coming to do this exhibition, uh, uh, it's, you know, some catharsis. It's, uh, it provides healing. It provides uh, reconciliation. And as we talk about this, uh, what, what's gone on in the exhibition, just the title alone, as we've shared the title, many people are coming to speak to me and say, you know what, I also, I'm also in that position. You know, uh, we also we're displaced and so on and so forth. So, and I'm sure I hope maybe some of the people in the audience right now could relate to some of this aspect of, of displacement, uh, where they are not, uh, where they were, uh, they, you know, they were born uh, and so on, just sort of disjointed uh, sense of identity. But that, that, that's our story, that's where it's coming from. But Louis can go on into how we now got into developing the title and um, of the of the exhibition. Uh, yeah, so I think to you know echo some of that sentiment, it's not just a bifurcated experience for myself and my sister. A lot of the people that we even spent time with were also people that had this experience with immigration or had parents that are from a different place to themselves. And so we grew up sounding a lot like each other uh, sometimes rather than our parents uh, because we really connected on that level. And so when we were thinking about the exhibition, um, there are some titles that we cycled through. We thought about everything but the kitchen sink, uh, specifically because both my dad and I are nocturnal workers. And we would work in separate rooms, but somehow, you know, around three in the morning, find our way to the kitchen. And over a cup of tea, we'd have a conversation about what we were working in uh, and, you know, the different ideas that we were cycling through. And even though, you know, there's, I think, some similarities in our work, there's also places where our work has diverged. And being able to get input from someone that works in a way different to yourself can be truly valuable. So, uh, you know, we thought about recreating that space quite literally and doing an installation of a kitchen in the gallery and opted for maybe a more tame version of that uh, in being able to have sketches and also think about the language that we use to be able to describe ideas of home and how language can truly be an access point for how we present ourselves and present parts of ourselves and explore ideas of home or different ideations of home. And so we arrived at home wherever the soul connects uh, from something that we read in a book called Daughters of the Diaspora. Uh, it's by a Nigerian Canadian artist named Ojo Agi, uh, who was also dealing with this idea of identity in the diaspora. And she gave, uh, or the person that wrote the foreword, Amy Saul, gave a really wonderful explanation of what home is, you know, that it can be sensory for so many people. I've been able to ask multiple people that I get to photograph to paint what their idea of home is or where home is for them. And for some people, it's a, it's a meal that they remember having when they were younger that their mother made especially for them, or it's a specific place that they got to visit. Or, you know, I think in our case, it's the relationships that were built around uh, the different places that we've lived and really growing close to people and being able to share your Yourself and your life with those people, that is where home is, I think, for me. And so it's not always a single geographical place on the map, like the title suggests. It's where we really find connection 
uh, and family and also thinking about how we expand our ideas of family to not just the people that we're directly related to but the people that add value to our lives so uh, it was it was incredibly exciting to be able to go back and forth and figure out what this show might look like and to arrive at something that I think is so meaningful to the both of us is incredibly special. Um, it's been really interesting, I think, because this has been our reality for so long, but to be able to engage with people that are really surprised uh, that I have an artist as a father and that we're getting to do a show together and how special that is, when I think this has always been a space that has facilitated connection and conversation between the two of us. So very, very grateful uh, to be able to share with uh, my first teacher in so many ways. Um, in high school, Crawford Mandumbo was actually my art teacher. Uh, and I think he's someone that I continue to learn from and I'm deeply grateful to have in my life as not only a father, but as you know, a friend. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Louise. Um, I think um, we, we talked uh, in the wee hours of the night about this exhibition. Uh, we talked about it many years ago. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, her and fine art, Ms. Ferners, uh, played a vital part in the realization of this, this show. Uh, we were two creatives uh, in, our, in, our, in our spaces, uh, in our elements, but really, I think the Ms. Hearn managed to get to catch the idea and was able to curate, uh, to facilitate and bring it to, to what it is today. And I'm, I, you know, I, I feel I've been, it's helping me, this show, this platform is beginning to show me some of what I hoped I envisaged um, many years ago. And I really, once more, just hats off to, to her and fine art for, for facilitating and enabling it, um, doing all the logistics and promotion and all the thinking around that just makes it what it is today. Mm. Um, I think one of the last things that we can maybe talk about in this exchange is some of the, the language that were kind of built around the show. So um, when people think about what it means to be African, I think there maybe isn't always an appreciation for how vast the languages are. Uh, there's multi multiple cultural groups that each have a distinct language. And so, you know, I've gotten to interact with some people that I've made work of that are from Nigeria that speak languages completely foreign to me, or even in Angola, and thinking about how so much of our history as Africans and family history is orally conveyed. Um, but, you know, when you're in the diaspora, sometimes it's conveyed in languages that you don't speak. Uh, which is the case for myself. And so, uh, you know, to kind of touch on what you spoke about as well, but having family that is from DRC, Democratic Republic of Congo, and Angola and Zambia also means having family history that is wrapped up in Portuguese and French, and then African vernacular and then English as well. And so if and when you have the opportunity to get to experience the exhibition, with that in mind, we'll try to make the language that was built around the show as accessible as possible by offering not only the phonetic pronunciations of the words, but also having the definitions so that you can engage with the work. I think a new, not just getting to see it, but also understand what the names that we've given the pieces are indicating. Um, and I think the benefit of getting to be here uh, on my end is getting to engage with people. And some of the questions that come up are around the two pieces that we've got on the invitation. Um, that we've gotten to share, which are the portraits that we've done of each other. Um, so I, I know that I would probably not do a self-portrait and it was um, actually at Ms. Hearn's suggestion that we uh, made work of each other. And one of the questions that had come up just last week was, was it hard to make uh, this painting of someone that you know so well, what was that experience like for you? So maybe you'd wanna go first and touch on that a little bit. Uh Making uh, paintings of each other. I think, you know, I was, I, I was wondering what you, what you pick uh, on how you'd want to portray me. Uh, or for, for me, I struggled in settling on which piece 
on how do I best portray Louise. You know, I went through uh, baby pictures. I looked at, you know, your pictures from 10 years ago. And, uh, you know, I, I went through, through that. But I, I ended up settling for, for this piece, I think because of what I, I see around, around you, um, you know, seeing you grow up um, from the baby, we, you know, uh, in, my, in my hands, see you grow up and the fun that we all went through. Uh, having me in class, in my art class and teaching you. I think this image of you, for me, it conjures uh, in my mind uh, the best of what, uh, what whom Louise has become um, because it was taken at the time, um, you know, uh, when Anyway. Okay, would you like me to, to um, speak about yours? Yeah. Uh, so, so I'm a little particular. I, I make it a point to photograph everybody that I make a piece of. And uh, in 2018, again, when I got to visit, I wanted to photograph dad specifically for a piece. So getting to capture him uh, as he is now, very close to how he is now was important to me, but maybe not so much as the direction of his gaze. Um, he's a very forward-looking, very optimistic person uh, who's warm and gentle and kind. And I wanted to be able to at least capture the forward-looking aspect of it. I think like you spoke to a little bit, just finding one image to represent someone that you know so well and in so many different ways uh, can be a little bit challenging. But I feel like uh, out of all the different people that I know, you're also someone that's quite determined. And I feel like there's a level of determination I guess to be communicated in this as well. So uh, that's how I ended up settling on or arriving at the image that I ended up using. Uh, and I think it also speaks to something else that I remember as well, um, that you know, kind of in between everything being busy with school when I was younger, we would go for walks and you're always walking ahead of me and turning around to make sure that I was okay. And so I feel like that, at least for me, when I look at it, that's the image that I have in my mind of those interactions that we got to have when we were walking and just having conversation. I think being in conversation is something that we have always gotten to have to some degree. So um, I think with that, we can maybe turn it over to and anybody that might have specific questions and maybe see if there's things that we might have missed about the show and how we arrived at where we are. I'll start off um, just to get everybody going. And everyone does have the opportunity to unmute now. <clears throat> so uh, Crawford, if I may call you Crawford, um, they say uh, you know a parent knows what a child is gonna be before they do. Did Louise? Uh, show any of this creative energy early you know does she pop out of the womb and say I'm ready to paint draw create um, I don't think it was that evident and Louise would tell you um, I also I think uh, being being her her teacher I, I, I taught many many students before and I compared her to uh, the best I've, I've, I've taught. And, and I was very hard on her. I uh, just kept feeling like she's just not making the mark. She's just not making the mark, um, you know. 
and we had the discussions and conversation. I said, do you really want to do art? Uh, you know, she was, you know, I think towards the last, uh, the last two years of her high schooling, two, three years, she said, I want to do art. And I was thinking, in my mind, I was still measuring her against some of the other students I've talked before. I said, Are you sure you want to do this? Uh, but she really just turned things around in her last year of high schooling, her last two years of high schooling. She just turned things around and blew us away, both uh, my wife and I. And we, uh, interestingly, I must say, the younger sister uh, is just doing the same thing. She's just done some work. She's doing her exams uh, right now. And her work is looking, uh, you know, mind blowing. And they say, okay, this is the same script with Louise. Earlier on, we said, there isn't much going on here. I know. So uh, earlier on, I didn't see, uh, you know, those traits. Uh, it was only right at the very, very end of high school that it uh, sort of blossomed. Thank you. And Miss Louise, um, do you feel like uh, you would have gone into a creative economy position as a full-time artist if you had not been born into this family, you know, exposed to the arts? Um, do you feel just growing up, you would have embraced um, your creative talents? Um, right, that's a great question, because uh, I, I think I can provide a little context. So Francis Town Botswana, uh, doesn't have too many museums or art galleries. You know, my first touch point with the visual arts was in my home and getting to see that that was something that was possible. Uh, and I think so often we might take for granted uh, just how important it is to see that something is possible. So he spoke a little bit about other students um, at the school. There's so many incredibly talented artists that I got to be in the same room with that maybe didn't have parents that had an appreciation for what was possible, uh, what your options might be if you got to pursue it further. So I, I really can't imagine a life other than the one that I have. And so it's a little hard to say that if I had different circumstances, I would have arrived at a different way of life than I have now. Um, so I'm deeply grateful that I, I got to have that exposure so young and so early and see what was possible. And um, it was it was really wonderful uh, to be able to see it. It was almost like alchemy, you know, getting to see something come together uh, out of nothing almost. And, and the type of joy that I got to see in him when he was creating work was also something that was really alluring to me because as much as he's been an educator and is an educator and a wonderful one, I think he just lit up in a different way when he was making work. And that was something that I was really drawn to, but just the joy that he seemed to have in the work that he was doing. So Crawford, how did you feel about Louise coming to the United States? I think it's um, it's God who did, did this. Uh, first of all, you know, I, I was once once we were convinced that she was uh, on this path. We thought of a school for her in South in, in South Africa, uh, but uh, you know, uh, Cody Calhoun um, has been a godsend who said, "Look, I think there's something that." I uh, can work out for Louise out there in the US. We were confident uh, of her. She demonstrated a good measure of uh, uh, responsibility, uh, self, good self-management uh, in different uh, scenarios. So we, we were confident that she, she could go and, you know, um, and do this. Um, so I think we, we were prepared somewhat because she, she, she had a trip for a month uh, while in high school, uh, Young uh, African Leaders uh, Initiative. She was selected to make that trip. She went out for a month. When she came back from the trip, when we received her in our arms at the airport, she broke down in tears. She had missed home just after a month. Uh, but uh, that was just, I think, just preparation. Uh, thereafter, uh, we we felt we felt comfortable. We didn't 
really fear at all. Louisa has been amazing. She's been, she's an amazing child. So Louise, has your experience in the United States been what you had hoped to be? And what's, what's next for you? I mean, I think I've been very fortunate in that even though I'm an international student, I've had a largely very positive experience here in the US getting to pursue my education. And a big part of that has been the people that I've gotten to meet, uh, people that have been wonderfully supportive of my practice and me pursuing my education. And I was fortunate enough to graduate uh, with my Bachelor of Fine Arts from UCA this May and intend to study further. So I'm really looking at refining my craft. I think I'm quite excited about all the things that I've gotten to explore, but want to try and dedicate as much energy and time into making sure that I uh, work towards that mastery that we speak of that costs 20 or 10,000 hours uh, of time and effort. And so uh, I'm looking forward to pursuing a master's degree in fine arts as well, and just uh, pursuing my practice and seeing what happens next. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, first, I'd like to say that I love the work that both of you create, and I have pieces by both of you that are, you know, hung prominently in my home. And also, you see my um, my intro photo is also one of Louise's beautiful pieces. But um, and forgive me if this question has been asked because I came to the conversation late. But I just wondered. Um, you know, being a parent myself, I always, you know, think about how, you know, you see the child, and I think that you often see the parent, or at least there's influences there. But also, I found that, you know, as my children have grown, that they have impacted me as well, in the way that I think about different things, and the way that I go about um, doing different things. So I just wonder, in creating this show about home, did you you know, have the opportunity to reflect at all how each of you have influenced, you know, the work of the, um, you know, of the other artists at all? Maybe let me, let me go first. Um, Louise did, um, Louise started uh, production uh, before I did. And I never got to say it, but I think we do influence one another. And Miss, Miss Hearn will remember, uh, one of the first pieces that we prepared and wanted to go with uh, on the invitation was a black and white drawing, um, which I started. And Louise's work just had this power over me. You know, it's like, it, pulled me in this direction to go to go gray. Um, and later along the way, I, I had to, to just say, look, stick to your palette, uh, stick to your, to, to your, to your screaming colors, uh, you know. So yeah, I, for me, I, I, was, I was influenced, not just, not just her. I think uh, as I work with other artists, it's very easy uh, to, to be swayed, you need to be focused because it's easy to see something that that easily works done by another artisan that works. That. So let me, let me, you know, let me pursue that. Uh, you 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 hear this in music as well. Uh, you if you just hear a certain formula rhythm that works. You can produce work in that sort of uh, schematic, and you you're confident that it will sell. So we do influence one another, and uh, one has to to deliberately make an effort to stay uh, on, their, uh, on, on, their, on their path. Thank you. Um, I think on my part, uh, in one of the earlier slides with his work, there was a watercolor piece that he did. And for several years, uh, dad worked as a watercolorist. And that was just, I think it's, it's an incredible, incredibly challenging medium to work with. But I think there's also a subtlety that comes across when you work with watercolor. That when I look at my work, even though, you know, we're working in, in different ways, I think I'm a little more tight and detailed and very focused on representation where, you know, his work is very expressive and colorful. I think that subtlety has carried over to how I continue 
to make work. Um, and so it wasn't until all the works were in the room and I got to see everything kind of flowing together that I really picked up on, you know, even though his work is incredibly colorful now that that subtlety that he worked with when I was growing up has been a really big influence in terms of how I think about making work and build out work and even the areas of the composition open. You know, that's all going back to starting with watercolor and thinking about compositions with watercolor and allowing the composition or the portrait to breathe by having those areas of openness. So I, I didn't properly pick it up until, you know, someone had said, you know, growing up, did you try and emulate the way your father worked? And in my mind, I thought, no, because we work really different ways. He has this wonderful looseness in terms of how he uses color where I'm very particular and a little more tight in how I apply things. But I got to see that through line and I'm really grateful for it because I think that's one of my favorite things about the works that I make. It's this openness and the space that I allow uh, and, and also this quality of unfinished at times. Thank you for your question. Hey, hey uh, Louise. Yes, sir. Uh, can you see us? Yes. Hey, uh, how are you, sir? I'm, I'm Do uh, Dr. Hearn. I'm Garbo's husband. I'm keeping an eye on Louise. I'm telling her to turn the lights off. Don't do this, Louise. It's not a dorm. But uh, what I wanted to ask Louise, has uh, my rhetoric and my you know, talking all the time about African-American history and just, just terrible things I'm talking about America, is, do you think that will affect your art? I mean, because your art, listening to your father, it is from kind of the homeland, from your souls. So you, you're going to be with us for a period of time. Are we, Garvin and I, affect, affecting your art in any way? You know, I think everything that you experience invariably, whether you, you are aware of it or not, does impact how you continue to make work. Because like you said, you're pulling from something internal. And so I think it will reflect in the work as I continue. Uh, and then also just in terms of the subject that I'm selecting, as much as I get to share uh, pieces that I've made of people that I know from home, there's a good selection of the pieces in this show that are actually of people that I've gotten to meet with and interact with here in Arkansas. So um, yeah, yeah, and I think for the better, everything kind of pulls in and makes the work better. What I have to say is, Louise, your answers are always vague to me. So let me um, ask your father, uh, as, as Louise evolve uh, moment to moment? I don't think there's much evolution. I think, um, I think from the earliest pieces, once she sort of found herself, She's pretty been consistent uh, with, 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 with her subjects. Uh, there's just been a bit of shifts on the, on the working, on the, you know, the, the, the touch, the finishes, but I don't think there's uh, a complete shift. I could, I could be wrong, but I don't, think, I don't see um, a, a major shift now. Maybe over time she might. Thank you. So from Facebook, we have a question uh, from Matthew Lopez. Um, I hope I got that right. Uh, he said, have you ever collaborated on the same work? If not, are there plans to? Um, I think collaboration would maybe require us to be in the same space first that we haven't necessarily gotten to make. Being in the same space, um, collaboration in this show kind of came in the form of figuring out the language that we were going to use and maybe some of the images or individuals we were going to make work of. And so collaboration in this show, at least on the level of, you know, there's at least one piece that we have uh, gotten to make of the same person. But, um, I would put in really quickly though, Luis, you do some digital illustrations. Crawford, do you ever feel like you'll get into that medium? I could see some, collabor some long distance collaborations happening that way maybe. I, I, I was thinking that way as well. I'm, 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 I'm multimedia, so I, I, I teach many different dis disciplines. So we can easily go multimedia. She can start the sketch on that end. I can print it out on this end, work it backwards and send it. We can do it. It's a good idea, actually. I want to do it. <laughs> Sounds good. I guess we're doing it. 
both of you know this is a progressive show. So as the work sells, we will be replacing it. So perhaps by December 18th, something will, yes. will happen, right? Yes, <laughs> yeah, will happen. Louis stuck the sketch today. <laughs> <laughs> Just, just any, any strokes, just put them here. Noted, we'll do. Yeah. Did we have any additional questions from our Zoom audience? Any additional questions? It is four o'clock. Uh, Garbo, would you like to share how everyone can collect the work of the artists featured today and talk about our upcoming programming? Well, definitely the work is on the wall. We're open Monday through Saturday from 10 to four and Sundays by appointment. We ask that you wear a mask and of course sanitize at the door. Uh, we are doing uh, walkthroughs with individuals or groups and we're hopeful that you call and make an appointment to do that. Louise will be on site Thursdays, Fridays, and Saturdays until the end of the exhibition. Uh, we are expecting a visit from Crawford uh, at some point in mid-December. We don't have the exact date yet, but we will definitely keep you posted on that. Uh, the next joint artist talk, well, the next talk is with Louise on November 7th at 3 p.m. and November 21st, the talk will be with Crawford. So there's definitely more programming ahead virtually and we definitely are keeping you safe by having uh, walkthroughs with the artists. So um, there's plenty of opportunities to do this and we're hopeful that you come and see the show in person. And if you're not in Arkansas, we also uh, do Zoom walkthroughs. We've, we've learned how to really use Zoom to our advantage and we were able to show you the work in a very creative way that you can see it like you're in the room and you're able to have a one-on-one -on -one with the artist. So there's no difficult way to see the show. We can make it happen. And we are, we're very appreciative of your presence here this evening. So Louise Crawford, you can have the last word to say good evening to our guest. All right, well, thank you once again, each of you for coming for your time. I thank you for your questions. It was much appreciated and really look forward to engaging with you further, uh, whatever way that might be. You're muted. You're muted. Can you hear me now? Yes. All right. So I uh, just want to say as well, thank you very much for everyone that's been able to uh, attend this uh, interview and uh, even all those that are joining us uh, via Facebook. Thank you for, for your time with us and we hope you found it uh, uh, quite enriching and um, that you keep on following the work. Thank you, Ms. Fern as well. Um, Fern Fine Arts for making this a reality. You're all very right. welcome. So thank you all for coming and we'll see you. What date is that? November 7th. We look forward to seeing you in the gallery as well. Goodbye, everyone. Goodbye. <laughs>